Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning. If you would like a outline, they are in the back somewhere. And as we begin this morning, we're going to pray for Mercedes and her two children. Uh, Amanda just received a text that they were in an accident, and they're called an ambulance. And so I guess she lives only a, a mile or two from church. So when she learns more, uh, Rob will update us uh, with a microphone. So let's pray for Mercedes and the children uh, that they will be okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning uh, that you have again blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful time of the year. And Lord, as we continue in thinking about this theme of uh, the beauty of the earth that you have given to us, Lord, even in spite of all of the fallenness and sinfulness in our world, there are still many beautiful things that we can enjoy and be thankful for. And Lord, today we think of uh, the theology of, a, of the body and how you would want us to think about this topic uh, as Christians. And Lord, we know that there's a lot of abuse in this area in our world, and much of it is very sad. So Lord, we pray that you would bless uh, this topic that we study tonight, a difficult topic, or this morning, a difficult topic. And Lord, we pray that if you would choose to use some of us in a ministry to help uh, victims of sex trafficking, Lord, we know that it happens in this city. And Lord, we know that many people, Lord, are damaged for years. Lord, we also pray for Mercedes and her two children uh, in this accident. We do pray that they uh, are okay. We pray for the ambulance uh, that will be coming on the scene, Lord, that they will be able to take care of her and the children. And Lord, we, we thank you for those in our congregation that have been willing to, to pick her up and bring her to church so that she can hear about the gospel. And Lord, we pray that you would, again, bless the remaining time we have this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, today we're going to look at the theology of the body. Um, continue it from last week, but I'm focusing specifically upon later in the lesson, specifically upon the theme of sex trafficking, because we know, we've known for at least a decade, maybe longer, that this is an issue all around the world, right? It's not just in our country. There's probably, you know, we, we read, I, I read different stats. I'll show you a book that I was reading this past week. There are lots of good blog articles about this. There are lots of good YouTube videos where you can listen to interviews of people that have survived this. Some of it's pretty dark and depressing, to be honest. Uh, it's one of those topics that you really don't love talking about, but um, there are some amazing things that take place uh, in people that are trying to help others that are trapped in this. I mean, this is like hell on earth. When I when, the more I read about this, it's terrible. One of the worst situations that a human being can be in uh, alive. Isaiah 60 18 through 19, describes a day when all of this, these troubles will be over, right? No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or devastate or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. That seems to echo a lot of what is found in the book of Revelation, right? There is going to be a day when there will be no more crying and no more tears when the Lord returns and the new creation is consummated. But that day has not yet come, and even though the gospel is found throughout all the earth, we still find terrible abuses, right? This is just one example that we look at today. There are many examples of the neglect, the abuse of a, of a theology of the body. <clears throat> I'll begin with an illustration called the weeping time about a slave auction in our country, uh, and there was a book written about this, and I found this, uh, this particular uh, book title example when I was reading an article uh, on a Christian website that had this link. In 1859, more than 400 enslaved people, men, women, and 30 babies from the Butler Plantation estates of the Georgia Sea Islands were sold on the auction block in Savannah, Georgia. 
uh, this author is writing, my new book is about this sale, the largest slave auction in American history. And then they have this slave auction and they're sent all over uh, different parts of the southern part of the U.S. And it's a story about the legacy of slavery, but it's also a story that includes something about resilience and how these people, many of, many of them were Christians, kind of coped with uh, this very difficult time uh, in our history as a nation, but also their own lives. Slave auctions were long a part of the fabric of American life, but on the eve of the Civil War, this unprecedented sale was noteworthy not only for its size, but because of the fact that the butler slaves had generally not been sold on the open market. And this owner of all of these slaves, Pierce Meese Butler, he sold these slaves for, a total of, for over $300,000, specifically $303,000. It was an enormous sum in its day, and people were separated from one another. And the story talks about the highest price slave was, was paid uh, a sum of $1,750 for a carpenter, and the lowest price was $250 for an elderly slave. And the story talks about uh, two sets of people, two slaves, one named Dorcas and Jeffrey. They were engaged to be married, but they could not get married before the slave auction, and so they were sold, and they were separated, never to see each other again for the rest of their life. The other example was what was of a couple that was married, and they were able to be sold as a unit uh, to their buyer. And the, the book talks about, you know, prospective buyers relentlessly poked and inspected the slaves. The same thing that happens today to sex slaves around the world, humiliating, embarrassing things. You know, reading some of these accounts just makes you want to cry about what is happening to minors, many of them are minors, and others are young women. It's heartbreaking stuff. Uh, I mean, I cannot imagine our, our police force that works in this, in, in this part of the you know, crime that, that deals with this and the things that they see uh, must be simply horrendous and heartbreaking. So again, the theology of the body and the concept of beauty aesthetics, right? God is a good God. And goodness goes with truth and beauty. We, we can't separate those things. And today's example of, of when we talk about uh, the sex trafficking movement, they've separated, they've isolated beauty from goodness and truth. And as I said in a previous lesson, the moment we do that, terrible things will happen, right? People are going to get hurt uh, in, in, this, in this terrible situation. So our first point, let's do a bit of, a, again, short, brief review from <clears throat> basic kind of statements that I think all of us would agree upon, well, for the most part. A theology of the body in relation to sex and marriage, okay? The Bible promotes a healthy view of sex in marriage as a great blessing. And we, you know, our, all of us need to hear that from time to time, and our young people need to hear that from time to time, okay? Genesis is foundational to this understanding of a human being and how human beings relate together in this specific area especially Genesis 1 and 2, right? This is kind of the basis for, you know, what is a human uh, and, and what is marriage? Our first thought here is that sexual intimacy is God's gift to any valid marriage. You don't have to be Christian to receive that blessing, right? Uh, hopefully, Christians understand the depth of that uh, more than unbelievers, but this is something that God has designed as a gift, right? So Satan did not invent sex, right? Unbelievers did not invent this intimacy. It comes from God. It's something that is good, and again, we should, we should openly teach that. Two, the unitive purpose refers to the one flesh statement in Genesis 2.24, right? That is one purpose for marriage. The two shall become one. Jesus quotes that in Matthew 19. That is a fundamental text about the intimacy in marriage. And it probably refers not just to the intimacy, maybe other things as well, but I think it definitely includes that aspect. Three, the procreative purpose refers to Genesis 1.28, right? God commands uh, Adam to multiply. Uh, I mean, that's one thing humans are supposed to do. That's not a bad thing. We're supposed to multiply, right? Children are supposed to be born. They're the product of, these, of this one flesh union. Four, this is where some of you may not like what I say. I don't know. I'll say it briefly and move on. Um, 
Sex is exclusively for unitive and procreative purposes in marriage. Again, at that point, I think none of you would disagree with that, okay? I think all of us would agree with that basic statement. It does not appear to be controversial, but the part that I'm highlighting, you may or may not agree with, and that is just as people try to separate goodness from truth and beauty, right? Also, most evangelicals separate the unitive from the procreative and they say, you can do one without the other, right? I was raised in a church like that. That's common evangelical teaching, okay? But I think that may be flawed. Again, you, you can disagree with me uh, on that issue, but birth control separates the unitive and procreative areas of intimacy. If you not want to have children, don't get married, okay? If you're not ready for that, uh, that comes with it. And again, personally, I do not think it's good to encourage people to use uh, birth control. I mean, I would, I would have taught that 20, 25 years ago, but I think it's really been destructive uh, in our nation and throughout the world. A hundred years ago, no Christian church would have taught, taught that it's good, right? It's something that's accept, become acceptable in our day, and I think it's healthy to push back on that and say it just creates more selfishness amongst people. Uh, again, you don't have to agree with that, <clears throat> uh, number five. Having sexual desires is normal, okay? This is one aspect where I think we can say God made us this way. That's not something that we should be ashamed about, right? Especially our young people. Uh, there should be some type of a healthy, right, uh, circumspect discussion about sexual relations that our young people should say, hey, this is something good. I'm learning this from the Bible, from the church, from my family, that I shouldn't be ashamed that I want to get married someday, right? Uh, and, and find you know, a, a spouse and have that intimacy with the spouse, that companionship. Uh, so if there are any good matchmakers in the church for young people, hey, go for it. Uh, if our young people, you know, if you can help encourage them uh, for, for them to meet up, that can be very healthy, okay? That's not, that's not something bad. People are getting married later and later, we're noticing in our society, right? Uh, they're not having children as soon as they, they they're just getting married later and later. Uh, some people don't even want to get married anymore. So, uh, in general, it's just a general statement. God created us with this desire, and that desire is not something you have to repent of, okay? But six, this is where uh, we've taught, we, we sometimes talk about SSA, same-sex attraction. Dan calls it USA, unwanted sexual attraction. And he says, when that level, all of us experience some level of that, right? And we know that there are Bible passages in both Old and New Testaments that do provide some warnings about this temptation, right? Common temptation, this is one of the most popular sins in the world, probably has been for centuries, if not millennia. And, right, there is something beautiful about this, this distorting this gift. Even when it's distorted, it's a very powerful temptation, okay? And so, you can open your Bibles and, and you can flip through Proverbs, parts of Proverbs 5, parts of Proverbs 6, and I think all of Proverbs 7, they're all these warnings about, about the danger of being tempted to commit adultery, right? And they're very vivid chapters. If you want to go read those, you know, they're, they, they speak in practical ways. You know, the, the biblical wisdom is not Greek wisdom. It's spoken so that young children can understand it, right? That's the point of it. Uh, it begins with the fear of the Lord, but again, it talks about the concept of the marriage vow and how that can easily be broken. Of course, we live in a day when it's no big deal to break your marriage vow, right? Uh, that's not really too much of a problem anymore. We know what Jesus says about this kind of temptation. I, I don't think it's wrong to be tempted necessarily, but it's wrong to fall into it and, and then let our minds wander or even our bodies wander, right? Either way, that's where it becomes sinful. And we all know that Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. I didn't get to this last week, but just another passage for us to think about. I quoted from it at the end. In, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul quotes from some things, and because we're going to talk later about forced prostitution, right, in our lesson, Paul, this was an issue in his day, right? In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20, uh, we read, I'll start at verse 13, "'You also say food is meant for the bodies, and our bodies are meant for food, but I tell you that God will destroy them both.'" We are not supposed to do indecent things with our bodies. We are to use them for the Lord who is in charge of our bodies. God will raise, raise us from death 
by the same power he used when he raised our Lord to life. Don't you know that your bodies are part of the body of Christ? Is it right for me to join part of the body of Christ to a prostitute? Right? That was the temptation for some of the Christians in that church. They, they thought it was acceptable to do that. No, it isn't. Don't you know that a man who does this becomes part of her body? This is a fascinating text that says this one flesh principle can apply to prostitution. Some commentators believe that, you know, if I go to a prostitute, I actually leave a stain on my soul that cannot be removed, right, maybe until the final day. There, there, there's, there's this, this is the one sin that Paul says you can commit against your body. There's something different about this, and that's why he concludes later on by saying, you surely know that your body is a temple where the Holy Spirit lives. And then he concludes in verse 20, God paid a price for you, so use your body to honor God. Uh, much more could be said about that passage, but we live, of course, in a world that be, the use of technology, you know, Instagram is not bad to use. I'm not saying that, but many people do use Instagram to simply show off their bodies. One author called this the pornographication of America, right, where young girls are just, it, their role models are seeing other girls show off their bodies, and that's something that's considered a good that's how you make money. That's how you get likes uh, in this world. And so, again, all of us have some level of, of temptation in this area. I think, all, and we've all given in somewhere, haven't we? But thank God that Jesus never gave in to this, and that's our hope is in the gospel, and forgiveness comes in what Christ has done for us. B, this theology of the body applies from conception to the grave. And this would, this would apply to unbelievers or believers alike, right? Care, dignity, and honor should be given to the body throughout life. Again, many different ways to illustrate this. We should care for humans of all ages of life, from the womb to the tomb, right? That should be obvious. We do not believe it is morally acceptable for hospitals and doctors to put elderly people to death, and they call it euthanasia. You shouldn't be able to schedule your death, right? That's immoral. And there are all kinds of arguments, well, I cannot have the quality of life because I'm in so much pain, so therefore I should be allowed uh, to be put out of my misery. Um, yeah, it's a powerful emotional argument, but morally it's not, it's not a good moral argument. It's really a utilitarian argument, uh, if anything. So there's a whole range of topics under this, this thinking of the theology of the body. I mean, orphans should be cared for, shouldn't they? Uh, George Mueller and, and, and other Christians started Christian orphanages during the Industrial Revolution during the days of England to get them off the streets. They were in dangerous situations. Uh, in many ways, helping sex survivors today of trafficking is another way of helping uh, young girls and ladies that have been in, in a slave market that is just terrible. But in addition to that, there are other kinds of trafficking. There are labor kinds of traffic, trafficking. There, there's trafficking that is related to uh, body organs, right? You sell, you're forced to sell a body organ, right, to get money to pay for your family to be able to survive with the basics in, in poorer parts of the world. So there, there's a lot of ugly things under the umbrella of I mean, trafficking. Trafficking is such a mild word, right? It doesn't really describe what is happening. Uh, and some of the definitions that are given, uh, they're almost too vague uh, so that you, they can be, uh, you know, done away with by people just be, ignore them. Two, the greater gifts of sex and beauty, right, if those are some of the greater gifts that God has given, well, the greater potential for abuse and misuse, and this topic that we look at today is a classic example of it, right? If God, the more precious gifts that God gives to us as human beings... Uh, they can be treasure, but they also can be terribly distorted, and we see that uh, in this whole theme of sex trafficking, okay? <clears throat> if it is true that God's gift of sexual intimacy ranks high on the list of gifts which are wonderful, sacred, and beautiful, not to mention private, intimate, and of one's free will, then it's not too difficult to understand why abusing such a gift will result in enormous devastation in the area of human rights, and, and I think that's what we are witnessing in our generation. Instead of girls and women being lovingly nourished in a good home, they are abused and treated like a commodity by selling them to anyone who will pay the price to violate their body and person. You know, no wonder some of these ladies that survive, they have PTSD when they come out. They're traumatized. And some of them have a very difficult time 
recovering. I suspect that all of them are going to live with some element of that for the rest of their lives of what, is, what has taken place. Uh, three is just an application that I mentioned last week, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but as a follower of Jesus Christ, and as I think about the theology of the body, I mean, what areas in my own life am I not taking good care of my body, right? And, and I just put in the parentheses, food and sex are two very common temptations for all of us, right, where we, we don't always take care of our bodies in that area. Uh, again, go back to 1 Corinthians 6. Our second main point is what we'll spend the, the remaining part of the time on this morning. And one of the goals here is not only to raise kind of an, an awareness of just how terrible this is, but perhaps God would, would put on the heart of some of you to get involved in this kind of a ministry in the future. There are some good ministries that are helping young ladies get out of this terrible life, and they're, they're called safe houses. Uh, there are ministries throughout our country. There are even some here in Phoenix. And uh, that is a real practical area of ministry, right? It would be, it's incredibly difficult from the things that I've read about this, a uh, very difficult ministry uh, to work in. But again, secondly, Roman numeral two, sex trafficking is a global reality and a horrific form of slavery, right? It's just selling a slave to the highest bidder. Uh, one of the books that I looked at this past week, and I'm, I'm going to give you the title because as I was searching Amazon, it was like $2.99 on Kindle. That's why I bought it, okay? It's called Sex Trafficking Inside the Business of Modern Slavery. Uh, the author is Siddharth Kara, or Kara Siddharth. I think it's a, a person of Indian uh, origins. And that movie apparently was made into a, that book was made into a movie called Trafficked. Now, I, I, don't, I can't remember who plays in that movie, but some people have said that the movie Trafficked uh, doesn't fully describe the reality of what this, of what this uh, situation is like for many people. They kind of made it too much into a Hollywood uh, thriller. This author, I don't think, is a Christian and definitely says things in the book that I did not agree with, but most of it, right, most of, this, of these topics, you can agree with even an unbeliever about what is going on, that this is wrong. Everyone seems to know this uh, when, we t when we talk about this. Um, this author, for over 15 years, has done research, and that, that was behind the writing of this book. And this author traveled to many countries all over the world and would actually go into brothels and open air prostitution areas. He would pay the fee to get into the room. And when he got into the room, he would interview the client, often minor girls, and ask them, like, where are you from? How did you get here? And, and the testimonies, again, what they say, they're just, they're just heartbreaking. Um, they, they are held there against their will uh, in, in just terrible living conditions. Uh, again, there are a few things, one of the things I don't agree with on the book, that he, he blames it all on capitalism, okay? Uh, and I think that's just a, too broad of a general statement of, of why he does that. But having said that, he mentions there are a lot of other things in the book that are profitable. Uh, if you can stomach uh, reading this, it's just, it's horrific. He has uh, an entire chapter on the economics of how this works around the world, and the organ is a sophisticated organization of uh, the money that is made and so on. His research, his research claims that human trafficking, especially sex trafficking, really began to rise at the takeoff and take off in the 1990s. So his theory is when the former Soviet Union collapsed and all of those little countries that now had their independence, that when the Soviet Union collapsed, those countries, their economies collapsed too, and they were mostly living in poverty, some of them abject poverty. And I think he does a, a convincing job of kind of explaining the demands that the West put on some of these countries, right, were just impossible to meet. The countries themselves are going into deep debt. And you just can't get a job in some of these small villages, right? And so people would come along, uh, recruiters, promising that if you come with us, we can get you a job in another part of Europe, uh, maybe as a seamstress, all right, as a domestic helper, uh, worker, and so on. And many of these young girls uh, signed contracts not knowing that they were signing and making agreements with traffickers, and they were going to be sold multiple times, and they were going to be held in captivity and bondage for years. And some of these ladies have gone out, they've got out, they've escaped, uh, to tell about it, but you know, practically every country is, is in this somehow uh, in, in, in doing this. 
All right. One example is that when Ukraine declared their independence from Russia, Russia punished them by draining the savings in the bank accounts of many Ukrainian families. Right? They now are bankrupt. They have nothing. The economy collapses, and some of these young girls, you just can't find a job. And what, where am I going to work? And they're given false promises that you can work in another country, and they're all trafficked, and they're all placed into a terrible situation, again, sold uh, repeatedly. Uh, throughout these terrible journeys. There's another book that I read. I, have, I don't have the book, but it's called White Umbrella. It's a Christian book, and it's written from the perspective of what can we do to help get, in, get involved in helping victims that are trapped in this particular form of slavery, okay? Uh, you know, back in the day when our country had slaves, there were many churches that said, be quiet, don't speak about this issue, don't rock the boat, okay? I hope that that's not an issue today as we, as we talk about the issue of, you know, human trafficking. It's just a sad reality. It's, it's unjust uh, what is going on. But again, this is a quote from the beginning of the, of the first few pages of White Umbrella. Quote, it's horrifying and absurd to think that there are currently more slaves on earth than at any other time in human history. Remember when I told you last year that the rise of all of this technology, which could be used so good, it's going to result in a whole new level of human rights abuses that we haven't seen and maybe, and, and maybe no one has seen historically? We're seeing that unfold, and with a combination of AI, we don't know what lies ahead in the future. And I don't want to be a pessimist in this sense, right? I don't want to come across that way. A. Sex trafficking, right, it's slavery, is a global business with big profits, and that's what keeps it going. All right, that's, that's a simple reason uh, why this thing keeps going. It's heartbreaking, it's ruthless, it's found all over the world in highly developed countries like, our, like America and in some of the poorest countries in the world like Bangladesh, Nepal, and, and, and many others. Uh, normal people that could be your neighbors could be involved in this and they don't look like criminals. they just like every, everyday normal people. I, read, I, I listened to a, a documentary on YouTube about a, a couple, a married couple in Ukraine, right? I, I've heard that the, the video said Ukrainian women are beautiful in Odessa, it's a port city, and that's where they're trafficked. And this friend of the couple, he said, look, I have friend, I'm traveling to Turkey because this, this, this couple, they owned a small business selling school supplies and they would travel to Turkey because the supplies are cheaper and they would come back. And he said, I can accompany your wife to go with her to make sure she's safe. And when they got there, he sold this guy's wife. And he actually called the guy to tell him that. And this guy is stunned and he didn't immediately react with emotion. He was calm, and he actually posed as a buyer and went to Turkey to buy his wife back. I mean, it's harrowing stuff, uh, you know, that, that happens. But again, normal, everyday people, elderly people are involved in this, right? Uh, there are little old ladies that are involved. They are agents recruiting, buying, and selling. Uh, you just think this, this, this doesn't fit the picture. But again, it's a global it's a global problem. Joe Carter, in the, in the, I quoted him at the bottom of the lesson. He says, human trafficking has been identified as the largest human rights violation in the history of mankind. Here are nine things you should know. And he goes through all of these things. And again, they're all, they're all quite sad. Okay? Number one, the profits for sex crime trafficking are, bill, are in the billions of dollars each year. I don't even know how much it is. Some people say it's well over $50 billion, and It just keeps growing uh, year by year. In the book that I read, the author says, quote, in 2015, there were approximately 1.59 million victims of sex trafficking in the world, generating annual profits for their exploiters of roughly 52 billion. These are conservative estimates that nevertheless dem demonstrate the broad scale of the phenomenon and the immense profits enjoyed by the exploiters, right? And there are different, different levels in, in, in how this is organized, and it's organized, again, in, in many countries of the world. Approximately 1.2 million of these 28.4 million slaves are young women and children who were deceived, abducted, seduced, or sold by families to be prostituted across the globe. These sex slaves are forced to service hundreds, often thousands of men before they're discarded. They have to pay off the debt, right? That's why they, um, they have to do this. They're, they're forced to do it, right? Right. Um, 
I suppose if they're not going to do it, they're going to kill them. That's how serious this is. And they, it's, it's, it's extremely brutal. In some of these situations, family members that are living in abject poverty, right, in the mountains, there's, no, there's just little work. They're selling their own daughters to people that they think are promising them a job. And you wonder, do they really believe that or are they just, look, because they're going to get money back, a small remittance every month, right, to help them live on. And sometimes a family will sell more than one daughter, and they may never see those daughters again. Uh, and so uh, this happens a lot in Nepal, in India, in Moldova, Myanmar, Thailand, and just countries all over the world, Eastern Europe uh, as well. Kara notes here, quote, drug trafficking generates greater dollar revenues, but trafficked women are far more profitable. Can you figure out why? Pretty easy. Unlike a drug, a human female does not have to be grown, cultivated, distilled, or packaged. Unlike a drug, a human female can be used by the customer again and again. And so many people have turned to this kind of human trafficking because they can make a lot more money for a longer period of time. And again, uh, it's just simply horrific. The things if, and, and as we move along in the lesson today, if you've read, a, if you've read something or you've watched a good video you want to share, um, I have probably 10 video tabs open of documentaries that I started watching, anywhere from five minutes to an hour and a half, and they're filled with testimonials of what these ladies are saying. Uh, and again, they're, just, they're heartbreaking to, to even listen to them. Some of them I just stopped listening to for a day, didn't want to continue it. Uh, it's, so, it's so discouraging. Two, sex trafficking is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. This is where, right, criminals have figured out they can make a lot of money at this, whether it's a legalized red, red light district in a particular city around the world, or if it's illegal. In some ways, it doesn't matter. There are lots of countries where the police are not your friend and they are taking bribes and they are involved in this business, right? That's, you know, here in America, we tend to view that the police are our friends, we support them. Uh, people don't think that, Christians don't think that in many other countries. Uh, the police are basically your enemy, and if you go to the re police and report them, they're just gonna return you to the brothel. They're gonna return you to the slavery. Uh, there are testimonies in the book that I read about that. Nothing, that you're in a different country. You have no passport, no paperwork. You are completely helpless, and you're never gonna go back home because your family in Nepal, you have shamed the family and they won't even take you back. It's like a double curse against you, you know, when you read about the stories of these, these Nepalese women and so on. Uh, border agents are easily bribed in many parts of Europe. <clears throat> uh, Italy is one of the uh, avenues with the coastline, right? They can bring them from other Eastern European countries and, uh, and even maybe parts of Asia. Uh, and they can just bring them in by boat and no one ever knows. And from there, they move them, they, they throw them in the back of a trunk and drive them to Moscow, right? That's how ruthless this is. They won't feed these girls upon their arrival for sometimes for four days. They have brutal ways of humiliating and breaking their spirits so they're not going to resist and they're going to work for them. Uh, that, that's what just struck me as so, so horrific. Um, I watched a video of a former Navy SEAL and a Marine recon guy that, I mean, a big, tough, burly man. And he heard about this and he, he, he was able to work with federal authorities and they went down to the southern border of Arizona. And they did all kinds of scouting work. They went up to the border. They, they found the markings where MS-13 gang said, this is our territory. This is on U.S. soil and we don't do anything as a country to rid ourselves of this. They have lookouts, right, on the, per, that are they're looking for our government vehicles uh, to warn everyone, don't go right now. And our country, and, and he, this guy was frustrated because he recognized that, you know, little is being done uh, to really deal uh, with this problem. Kara says in, this art, in, in, in an, uh, a short article called, uh, a, a paragraph said, the anatomy of sex trading, all sex trafficking crimes have two components, slave trading and slavery. Slave trading represents the supply side of the sex trafficking industry. Slavery represents the demand side. We, I mean, demand is just keeps going up, right? Men keep like this, it's becoming more accepted, more popular, more legalized, and so uh, people would say, well, we want to legalize prostitution in the country because it will, it will lower all the risk. It's done the opposite. The risk has skyrocketed, right? Uh, the slavery has skyrocketed. Uh, on this side. Slavery represents the demand side. Within these two components, there are three 
three steps, acquisition, movement, and exploitation, right? Summarizes, I think, quite well uh, what has been going on. There, is still, there are still some countries where being a single lady, not being married, has terrible economic and social consequences, right? Two would be Albania, Nepal. I think you could also throw in Moldova and others. So traffickers have figured out schemes to send men in that pose as boyfriends, as lover boys. They'll develop a relationship with the lady and they will agree to marry them. And after they marry them, they often sell them on the night of the wedding, right? That's how, that's how ruthless this is. Uh, and the lady is duped, right? She, she has no future in her home village and they're just hoping I can find something better somewhere else, right? They're, so there is something to the issue that living in abject poverty tempts a human being to do anything to survive. Right? I, think that's, I think that is. Um, and if you're not a Christian, right, you may entertain the, uh, the opportunity to do something. You say, it's got to be better than where I am now. Now, one, one thing that is extremely depressing for me to think about is a young girl somewhere in the world, and that young girl is not a Christian, and she lives a life of a slave, she's abused, she dies, and, is not, and, and does not go to heaven. That's, that is an incredibly difficult element of suffering, right, to think about um, for a human being. Refugee camps are prime targets for recruiting women and children, uh, and so on. Three, organization ranges from families to sophisticated crime syndicates. Uh, again, this is in our country as well uh, as it is in others. Sometimes families are selling their own children, right, to make money. Uh, you, there are stories of this happening in our country as well, uh, very sad stories. Um, some of these countries, you know, read story about families in the mountainous regions of Nepal. They're being raped by their uncles anyways, and they're like, well, I might as well get out of here and try to make some money. And it's like no better when they, when they finally reach their destination somewhere in India than when they're with their own family. This is, Christianity has not taken root in many of these places, and there's a lot of depravity uh, that, that takes place within families before some of these girls even get uh, to their final destination. Uh, to me, it's a hell on earth for, for these young girls. And the, the, the desire for younger and younger girls is increasing. And one of the reasons for that is men think, well, I can't get HIV from a younger girl. Right, uh, and so there's all kinds of uh, different different. The youngest, uh, the youngest person that I read that was sold at age of six by her mother, um, and she describes what she went through. Uh, for, for and this was in Belgium. This was not in some poor nation. And she describes the things that she went through uh, for for several years. <clears throat> in many of the situations with poor families, they're already in debt and they cannot pay back the debt. And so someone comes along and says, I'll give you X amount of dollars, right, maybe $200 for your daughter, and they don't tell them, you know, that you're going to have an interest payment on that. It's shark loaning. It's terrible. They can, in some cases, they can never pay back the money. They're just getting deeper and deeper into debt, and that is why they feel forced to sell a family member. This author, Kara, says, in rare cases, parents sell their children out of greed. These parents become accustomed to the remittances sent back by slave owners who use these paltry payments to entice more families to sell their children. A jittery young woman named Bridget, who was pressured to remain in sex slavery for years because of remittances, said to, said to her parents, uh, sent to her parents, told me, quote, we are like slot machines to our families. Four, Millions of girls and women are trafficked throughout the world. Boys are also trafficked in certain parts of the world as well, but it's predominant. You know, if there's any discussion about men and women are different, this just exposes it, right? This is not a problem with women, uh, in a sense, frequenting a brothel. It's primarily men and, or younger men doing this. In addition to all of the young women and girls who are under 18, some as young as 10, young boys are also sent to certain parts of the world, parts of India, maybe parts of Thailand for sex slavery. Recruiters of young women and girls may be known to the family. That's, that's another irony uh, that is in this. It's kind of like there's this spectrum between voluntary and involuntary, and it's kind of like where is it at with this particular case? Um, are they knowingly entering this? 
The same author says, quote, most victims I interviewed were under the age of 25 and most suffered debilitating physical injuries, malnutrition, psychological traumas, post-traumatic stress disorder, and infection by a scourge, scourge of sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV and AIDS. This author says, I never truly understood this story until I first laid my eyes on Maya. Gaunt and distressed, she was 19 when I interviewed her. After almost four years as a sex slave in each of Mumbai's two main red light districts, she was born in Nepal, one of the poorest stretches of land on the planet, with an annual per capita income of $180, or 50 cents per day. Desperate to make ends meet, her parents sold her to a local agent for $55 on the promise that she would have a good job at a carpet factory, from which she could send home up to $10 a month. The night Maya left home, the agent resold her to a dalal, that's a trafficker, who, that's probably a Hindi word, I guess, who took her to Bootwal, a border town with India, where they spent the night with another girl. The next day, Maya, the other girl, and the Dalal crossed the border into India by foot. A few days later, they were in M Mumbai. Right? Mumbai is like a modern London, right? if you've ever been there. This is what Maya told me happened next. Once I came to Mumbai, the Dalal sold me to a Malik. That's a brother boss, I guess, in the brothel. The Malik told me I owed him 35,000 rupees, which is about $780, and I must have sex with any man who chooses me until this debt is repaid. I refused, and his men raped me and did not feed me. Right? That, that's how they're going to break the spirit of these young girls. That's one way they do it. When I agreed to do sex, they gave me medicine because I had a urine infection. I was in that bungalow, this small house, two years and made sex to 20 men each day. I mean, that's, that's horrific. That's being raped 20 times a day, uh, the, these girls. There were hundreds of girls in this bungalow, many from Nepal. One time I tried to escape. I complained to the police, but they did nothing. A few days later, the Malik's men found me on the streets and took me back to the brothel. The Malik put chili paste on a broomstick and pushed it inside me. And he broke my ribs with his feet. And then they, they, they give you maybe a day to heal and say, get back to work. I mean, this is, this is like American prisoners are treated far better than these girls, right? The, the people at Guantanamo Bay are treated far better than what we're seeing, uh, you know, eyewitness testimony. That this is what I went through uh, and so on. Um, it's, 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 it's terrible. I mean, some of them are not going to read because it's so graphic. Uh, it's hard to believe that a human being will do this to another human being's body, right? This is an anti-theology of the body. It's an anti-Christ theology of the body. She says, I was pregnant two times, and the, the boss gave me pills to kill the baby. She eventually discovered that she had AIDS. They helped me contact my father, but he told me not to come home. He said, I can never be married, and because I have HIV, I can only bring shame uh, to the family. You know, there, there's no gospel of Jesus Christ at this point in their life. That is the ultimate solution, isn't it? But there are also common grace solutions that we believe should be extended to all human beings, whether they are Christians or not, that are trapped uh, in this terrible environment. Again, families who sell their daughter later will disown them once they found out they were working as a prostitute. They will not listen to them. Apparently, Indian men like the Nepalese ladies better than the Indian women. And that's why there's just this, this demand uh, from the poor regions of Nepal uh, to bring many of them into India. Five, 30 to 40 percent of these victims are children, right? Many, again, are from poor, broken homes, but not everyone. There, there are a lot of American stories of uh, American teenagers uh, that just were rebellious. They didn't get along well with their parents, and often it's a one-parent home. And they just decide they get an older boyfriend that's going to take care of them, right? And it seems to go well for a few months, and then the boyfriend turns out to be the pimp and, and abuses them terribly. And there's often drug addiction involved. And so the girl wants money for the drugs, so she is forced to do uh, sex acts for all of his friends so that he's going to give her drugs. It's a vicious cycle uh, that just keeps repeating itself. And in some of those situations, these girls seem to walk into this with a voluntary, uh, you know, they're willing to do this to get the drug money or 
uh, the drugs. Uh, it's very sad. In, in one, one particular region of India, uh, of Nepal, known as uh, the Badi people, B-A-D-I people in Nepal, you know, many of them come from some of the poorest regions, and there, there's a lot of ethnic uh, divisions and groupings within this whole I issue. You know, different nationalities have different amounts that they sell for, and it's really strange, it's really perverse, it's really, really sad. Um, but a lot of this involves, it, it, a lot of this is purely criminal, isn't it? It's, it, it's, it's raping minors. It's, it, and you wonder, where is this going to lead to? Uh, the, the police in many countries, like in India, they just, they just turn a blind eye. They don't do anything um, because they're getting a commission off of it. Um, and so they're, they're also often the customers. In, in, in our, where we lived in the Philippines, we lived near the capital. And we lived in the capital near the, near the Congress building, but there, there were families that their daughters were prostituting when it got dark out. We'd drive home from church and see them there. And sometimes you'd see the police officers going over there, parked in front of their house too. You wonder, like, what's going on? Uh, I don't trust these guys uh, in that sense. Nigeria is one of the poorest countries in the world with a per capita income of $1,000, 1,154, right? Runaway inflation, massive debt load, the IMF that drains government coffers at the expense. They don't have social services like we have. We have a lot of things here uh, compared to some of these places. And Nigeria presents a really odd uh, situation. Up to 80% of Nigerian sex trafficking victims in Italy belong to a single ethnic group, the Edo people. And this is really... Again, sad and strange uh, to hear how they do this. This is one of the most conservative parts of Nigeria where if you're married and another man simply touches your wife with a finger, you have to go through a spiritual ceremony to cleanse your wife, okay? They're not a Christian culture necessarily. There are Christians there, but they would be very animistic, I think, and they would have all of these elaborate rituals. And the recruiters are capitalizing off of the superstition of the people, and that's how they recruit these Nigerian sex slaves. They send them through this elaborate spiritual ritual, the Edo women of Nigeria. It's called a juju ritual, and it's something where the women are convinced if they break their vow, evil will befall them and their families. And so the Nigerian women of all people throughout Europe, you know, they're the most, uh, they're the most African prostitutes in Italy and other parts of Europe. They are the most loyal prostitutes that will never ever testify in court because they believe if I don't fulfill my vow and pay my debt, terrible evil will fall upon my family. I mean, there's some strange, the, the, the rich, I'm not going to read the ritual because it's a little bit graphic and it's probably a little bit perverse, but that holds incredible power over these women. And the reading that I, that I went through this past week tells me that these are like the hardest working prostitutes. They will work to pay off, the, off that debt as quick, quick as possible. They will endure all kinds of terrible things. Uh, and it's just another example of, a, of the fallen nature of the world that we live in. Um, they may not even at times see themselves as victims, right? They may, they may actually take pride in fulfilling a vow uh, that they made so that they can send money to their parents who are living, again, in abject poverty. Six, handlers know how to break the will of their victims and make them work. Again, this is probably the most difficult part of the reading that I did. You know, you, you, you think you've got a strong woman that's going to say no to to the sex traffickers or to the new boss, and, and, and she's going to refuse. And they will do terrible things to ladies to break their will to get them to do what they want them to do. They, they will starve them. They will break their arms. They will break their ribs. All kinds of physical humiliation. They will chain them up, and they will, they will drug them. You know, one, one girl from India or from Nepal said the, the lady that she first met when she arrived at her destination where she thought, this is my new employer, gave her an ice cream cone. It was laced with drugs. She said, I was out for three days on a bus ride. I don't know what happened. And then when she arrives to her first destination, she's broken in by meeting six German men in a hotel room that raped her all night, okay? Uh, they know how to make these girls compliant and they know how to force them to do what they want to do because they're gonna make money off of them, right? These women are treated worse than animals in our country, farm animals. A, a, a cow that's being milked is probably treated better. These are people made in the image of God. You know, it's just, it, this is hard. The gospel should have some impact, right? 
uh, in, in dealing with this terrible situation uh, that people find themselves in. And so, uh, I'll read a, few, a little bit more here, but one author said, this is also pretty sad. Uh, Kara says, other victims such as Tayani are acquired and sold several times en route to a final point of exploitation. Such sales take place at established buyer's markets where victims are forced to strip naked to be inspected by potential buyers for deformities, venereal diseases, and overall attractiveness. Agents representing numerous establishments and crime groups will purchase slaves in a similar fashion to slave auctions in the antebellum American South. But this seems to be far worse, right? The numbers are far greater uh, than, than what we are reading about uh, in this situation. Girls that try to escape pay dearly if they're caught again. Uh, they pay dearly with being beaten. Uh, one, off, one girl tells us that, you know, one of the girls in their brothel escaped only to be discovered. They beat her so bad they broke her spine. Another girl, they slit her throat in front of all the other girls to intimidate them, and they made the girls clean up the body of this girl that they cut their throat. And that's a lesson, right? Don't disobey us or the same thing will happen to you. So they're not, they're, 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 they will starve their victims, they will beat their victims, they will do whatever they have to do, drug them uh, to make them compliant with all of the men. I read about a Japanese man that came to this brothel in Bangladesh, and I mean, I'm sorry, in India, in Mumbai, and he wanted a Nepalese girl that was very young, and he thought that this young girl was a virgin, but she had already been broken in, right, about a few months earlier, and she didn't say anything, and he, he bought her for two weeks. And the injuries that I read from this girl about what this guy did to her, it's astounding. The, 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 she, how do these young girls survive this? And yet many of them do. That's what's incredible about some of the stories. These ladies are, they're, they're both terrible victims, but they're also resilient in how they respond to some of these things. B, rescued victims retell their heroin captivity. As you know, Arizona-Mexico border is a major point of trafficking for not just sex trafficking, but all different kinds of sex of, of trafficking. Living conditions range from miserable to unbearable. Some of these Young kids in India are in, literally in cages on the streets, and there are testimonies of girls that were like, they lived that way for two years. Uh, when they're not with a man for 15 minutes in the room, they're with a cage on the street. They're all given quotas. You gotta, you gotta meet this quota of, of 20 to 30 men per night, and if you don't meet it, you don't get as much food tomorrow. Or if you need medicine, we're not gonna give you medicine. So it's a terrible psychological uh, mind game and warfare that they're they're playing uh, with these young girls, right? These quarters that they live in are filthy, dirty, they're cramped, they're crowded. Drugs and alcohol are common, again, to keep them compliant and to do what they want them to do. In Italy, prostitution is legal, and in the wintertime, young teenage girls are forced, it's cold outside, they're forced to go outside in, in nothing but their bra and underwear because that's what the men are looking for. They can inspect the women as they drive by, and this is who I want to purchase. They don't even go into a building sometimes. They just go right there in a dark alley uh, behind a bush. And some of these girls, they're given alcohol to keep them warm. They're, they're, I mean, you hear the testimony. These girls are just saying, like, I have no life in me. I feel darkness in me. I uh, don't even want to exist. They, they have nightmares about living on the streets uh, for a couple of years. Uh, here in the U.S. and also in Europe, holding women hostages in apartments guarded by men is quite common where you cannot escape. Two, most victims were given no choice, but some ended up accepting this life. That's the real irony. There are ladies that were sex slaves, and they graduated to a slave instructor, and they still remain in the work. I guess they think there's nothing else I can do with my life, and so they just stay there, and they manage the brothel. Uh, that's also, it's ironic, it's sad to hear things like that. Three, trafficking may involve pornography, threats actual and voluntarily. And I think this might be something more on the Western side of this issue. Uh, I listened to uh, some interviews on YouTube of two young girls. They were probably 17, 18, bad home life. They found a boyfriend that gave them attention. He was older, he had a nice car. He had the things that he, they did not have in their home. And he started buying them gifts. They started living together. And of course, drugs are involved. And after a period of time, the guy says, look, if you still want these, the, the drugs and the gifts, you've got to start doing something for me. 
And these ladies at first are confused, and then they realize, ah, my boyfriend is my pimp. Uh, we read about these girls getting tattoos, and the pimp's like, I own you. They may beat the girlfriend in the morning and rape them at night. It is such a strange, perverse relationship. Uh, Fox News had a story of a Mexican girl uh, that was trafficked at a very young age. And I read this, I think, a day or two ago. And she talked about how her boyfriend would beat her until she's bloody, and then after she is recovering, he would give her roses. And this is a regular cycle to control people. I mean, isn't that a terrible form of love? That's not love, is it? Uh, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking, and, and she, she made it through it. Some of these girls that are pregnant and have their babies, uh, their pimps will take the baby away at a young age, and they don't know if they're ever going to see their baby again. Sometimes a baby will return with cigarette burns on the bodies. And, you know, these, these mothers, they, they are just crying out for help. Uh, and so... In some of these situations, some of these American girls said, well, they, they said they're going to film everything. And they said, if I ever try to escape, they're going to send everything to my parents. And they're going to put all of it on the internet. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, this lady got out of it. She's rescued. But she said she, she lives with shame because her parents thought that she was doing this because she wanted to. And all of it was against her will. And they tried to take it to court case with lawyers. No one has been held accountable. She says, all of it's still out there on the Internet. I can't take it down, right? So those are, those are examples of some really difficult uh, situations uh, that, that take place uh, here in our country. Four, our church is in a refugee corridor, and we would be dumb to think this isn't happening under our noses, right? I don't know exactly where it's happening, but... One of the things that we could pray about, and I mentioned this last week, and th this is debated, right? Are our major sporting events occasions for this activity to increase? I don't know. Some people say yes, some people say no. I know the, F the P Phoenix Police Department changed their thinking on this back in 2016 at the last Super Bowl. Instead of looking at every prostitute as a criminal, they started looking at, the, at them as a victim and said, we gotta go after the guy who's in charge of this. And that seems to have... Uh, been a good move on their part because the more we read about this, the more we realize that some of these people, men and women that are controlling these women, right, this is full-blown human rights violation, criminal-like activity. And so our church is located in one of these situations. We're not a country church in Nebraska, right? We're located in a major American city, and I think there are ministries here in Phoenix that are worthy for us to think about, could we fund these ministries somehow? Could we get involved in volunteering to help some of these people? Uh, some of these are already established, or maybe God would use some of you to start something new uh, in the future. I don't know, but as we approach the Super Bowl next week, I am not saying that the Super Bowl is promoting this. I, that, that would be a, a foolish statement. They're not doing that, okay? The news articles have belabor that point this past week. There's, they say there's no direct connection between the NFL and trafficking. I, I agree with that, right? But it's, it's perhaps as an occasion for this to, to take place uh, on a greater level when many people gather for this big event. I think you can still enjoy watching the Super Bowl. I'm not saying that anything bad about that. But maybe we can pray together throughout this week that God would uh, help some of these ladies to be rescued from this very difficult uh, life of slavery and that God would give our policing officials, right, some courage to do what is right uh, in this area. Questions or comments? I know we're about out of time. It's a very difficult subject. M Mrs. Carson, uh, we have up here. Right here where we are is a major child trafficking area, and a lot of the apartments are being watched by police for, for them. But there's a way that they get your child, too. If you have renters in your neighborhood, I might mean, say this in a bad way, but renters are renters? the ones that will oh. traffic okay. because they can clear out really fast. But... Yeah. Um, they may have children, and their children end up bringing other children into right. the home. And um, a guy may offer to photograph them, you know, and he will do nice photographs, and may even send them back to the family to show you the pictures he'd taken. Mm -hmm. But from there, they progress to m men being there at the house who will then abuse the children. But the children are told, 
if you say anything about this, we'll kill your parents. Right. And they're very stern with them about that. And um, this could go on for many years. After the child reaches a certain age, they're not interested in them yeah. anymore. But they have posted those pictures of those children on the internet and are, are being bought. Some of them even want to buy that particular child, you know. Yeah, and, I, I learned that there was a website called Backpage or something yep, like that yep. that was shut down by the FBI yep. several years ago, and that's where people were buying things. Even Craigslist was using this stuff, and I'd yep. never heard of that before. Oh. Uh, I didn't know that was going on. Well, we know of le probably eight children that were trafficked. There are probably other sites that have popped in this up manner. to replace that. So, yeah. um, our daughter, working with her organization, Kick It Darkness, has dealt with a lot of this trafficking issue and people calling her and telling them, I am being trafficked. Mm. And she is able usually to find a connection where they can get that person. They have um, an underground railroad that uh, that person may go into a laundromat and from there they go into protection in the underground railroad of normal people right. like us taking them into their homes and passing them on and passing them on until they really reach a place of safety. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite difficult uh, yeah. when you hear about this. So, yes, Sue has a, has a thought here. Uh, very short, but if as horrible and ugly and, I don't know, perverse these things are, but for the grace of God, and that's a truth, right. For the grace of God, right. we could all be there because before Absolutely. Christ, right. that's the minds oh, we I, have. We're I agree. totally depraved. Yep. Yeah, that's true. You know, one of the things I've struggled with after reading about some of these guys, like what, how do you penalize them? You know, what would be, what's the proper penalty, penalty if they're caught? And that's a tough issue. Yes, Bill. Uh, just a quick comment. What you taught through the paper of yours this morning is condensed in about the last half of Romans 1. Mm. And that applies yeah. to every one of us in this room. Right. It's not just those bad guys. Right. That are, that's us that it's yeah, talking no. about. Yeah, I'm not saying that. If it weren't that, for yeah. the grace of God, right. we would all be there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to leave that out just for the sake of time. Um, you know, thank God that He has saved us and that He continues to forgive us, right, in our own struggles uh, in whatever area this may involve. We are about out of time. Thank you for your thoughts, comments, and uh, again, if you want other books, there are, there are some good Christian books on this topic, but uh, maybe this will pique the interest in some of you that this could be a future ministry uh, to get involved with to, to help these people. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this day, and Lord, we know this is a difficult topic. It's an uncomfortable topic, Lord, but we pray for all of these trafficked people around the world, many of them are children, they're minors. Lord, crimes are being committed against them multiple times every day. And Lord, we are thankful for ministries that are actually out there seeking to expose this and help these children and women, Lord, by not only providing a safe place for them to stay, but also to share the gospel, the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, we are thankful for the grace you've shown to us we thank you that you haven't allowed us to, to descend into even greater evil than we sometimes think about in our minds. But Lord, we pray that you would use uh, Christians and other concerned citizens uh, in our nation to try to put an end to some of the terrible things that we're seeing happen uh, to human beings. And Father, we do pray that you would prepare our hearts as we come to worship you in the next hour as Pastor Dan continues to minister to us uh, through First Peter. Lord, we're thankful that we can come to worship you and hear from your word today. And Lord, we pray your blessing upon our afternoon. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.